Welcome to Small Business Success Talks Summer of Strategy Series, where I interview guests to get their expertise in marketing and business development to help us all plan accordingly for the rest of 2023. Summer is a perfect time to evaluate how well, or maybe not so well, the year is going, determine what the gaps are, and learn from some of the best in the business building industry, their strategies and tactics to close the gap and build momentum in your own business and life. I am your host, Christy Smallwood, and let's get strategic. <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome, Annie, <laughs> to the, this episode <laughs> of Small Business Success Talk. You are landing during my summer of strategy. So, yes, I know. I'm so excited. This is something new for, our, for the show because... Uh, we're building it out into different segments, so different opportunities of what people might want to be interested in listening through this umbrella of a channel. So kind of like building out it, bu- coming at this as a whole channel as a show or a show as a channel concept, whatever. But <laughs> just to give the listeners an no, idea don't of how crazy that. it's going to get. Yeah. Oh, here we go, listeners. Put your seatbelt on Uh, but i love that you're doing summer of strategy because for so many people our competitors go to sleep during the summer and our Uh clients sort of tune out for the summer and so we kind of take this forced not enjoyable vacation like we fully take the time to go off and be like well they're not here i'm gonna go and live my life and have a wonderful time we just kind of go into like stressed hibernation so I love that you're doing summer of strategy to keep people actionable this summer so that by the time your clients wake back up, you're in a much better spot than not only your competitors, but yourself where you were when everybody else, you know, Rip Van Winkled for a while. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm glad to have you on board with, with these episodes. You, like so many others during this summer, are part of the Marketing Podcast Network with me. So just excited to be a part of this, that whole community of people who, you know, know, know a lot of smart things. And I'm having you guys share with my audience on all of your smart things. So (laughs) here's a starter question for you. I've been asking everybody. It's been a very interesting question for me to come up with it. What would you want people to know about you before you even entered a room? What would I want people to know about me before I even entered a room? I love that question. And the answer is how I make people feel. And how is that? I want the stuff. I want people saying like, Annie's going to make you feel like the most important person in the room. Annie's going to make you feel totally seen. Annie's going to make you laugh. If you're nervous, Annie's going to make you comfortable. If you're an introvert, Annie's going to make you feel safe right? Like, that's what I want. So that because I I tend to come in quite large. uh, And (laughs) and that's right, like, hello, I am here. Right. But it's um, I like to think of it as like infectious enthusiasm, that by the time I get there, people know that it's not performative. That's really me. I really do show up like that but I really do want to get to know them. So it's not just about me, it's about us. So yeah, I want people to know that all that big entry is really (laughs) for their benefit and that (laughs) I can keep it real with them any old time. (laughs) We're going to get along great. (laughs) Yay! (laughs) We have similar energy. So that means all you listeners out there, seriously, buckle up. (laughs) This is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You might want to turn the volume down a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) And here we go. (laughs) <laughs> okay. So give me a little bit of an idea. Like we talked in the green room about, you know, like what, what's your business thing, but give me a little bit more of an idea for the listeners of what the scope of your expertise is. And out of that, then what keeps you going? Like what keeps you on fire to even do the thing you do? So scope of expertise. Uh huh. Okay. So since about 2009, I have been obsessed with marketing and specifically helping people find beacons that serve as their magnet to bring the right people to them. So that's been my long-term love is that deep, deep love of marketing. But since 2019, 10 years in, after seeing so much entrepreneurial struggle, I realized that none of the marketers or none of the people doing marketing around me were making any money. And I thought, what? 
how is this happening? So I realized that it was because the heart-centered, mission-led people around me really had this deep, deep stigmatization of what selling could be and who they would have to be in order to sell. So 10 years into my business, I decided, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's the bigger problem we have to do. We can't just over market, we have to sell. So in 2019, I started teaching ethical, introvert friendly, impactful, completely values driven, uh, and listening based selling, which I have done for the last four years, uh, and really found a home over there. So that is the breadth of it. What keeps me going, though, is my earnest desire to help people keep their dreams alive. As a little kid, if I saw a going out of business sign, even somewhere like a business that I would have no business going into, like a Jiffy Lube, like I'm eight. <laughs> like, you know, I don't need a freaking oil change. I'm eight, right? But I would just ball. I would ball hysterically as a kid because to me, that was the death of a dream. And as a marketing consultant and as a sales advisor, I get really intimate with my clients' dreams. And so what fuels me is making sure at the end of the day, they're a step closer to that realization than they were the day before and that they're honoring themselves in the process because what a lot of people don't talk about is that small business can be freaking brutal, mm -hmm. right? So it often feels like the dream is gonna die. So if I can be a lighthouse for you and just keep you on the path and say, listen, you're not failing, you're growing. Sometimes it feels the same and we can do whatever we need to to ethically keep that dream alive. I'm going to keep on going. Okay. So one observation I've already made of you and you and I literally just met. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that you have this really unique gift to be able to take what I call airy fairy verbiage and mm -hmm. make it have some rubber meets the road roots. Right. I feel like, oh, that's how that makes, like you have this energy of action along with the meaning behind the authenticity and honoring yourself, like all of that kind of stuff. Most of us business owners, the small business owners are very direct, big dream people like direct, but ADD, we don't have time to oh, get yeah. into the feely words a whole lot, yep. Yep. but I sense that your energy is able to put action behind the feely words and really make it come to life out in the world. I'm fascinated with you already. Yay! <laughs> I love that compliment and that uh, kind of summation of me in that I think I've been in business long enough to go kind of a full journal with, or full circle with the feely words, right? Like as a brand new business, you hear the feely buzzwords and you're like, yes! That sounds amazing. Right. I'm going to dedicate my life to that. And then you have to realize that you have to like learn accounting on the fly. And so, exactly you know, transparency <laughs> is not really like the top thing. If I'm just trying to figure out how zero cannot hate me and how to pay my quarterly taxes on time. Right. Like, and then you kind of fall out of it. And then, you know, maybe you're in a period of entrepreneurial struggle and everyone around you is just saying, Oh, just be authentic. Just be consistent. And you're like, I'm so burned out. Is that consistent? I'm authentically burned out. Does that work? Like, what? Da, da, da. But I've been here long enough and I've advised so many businesses to see this way that these emotional things really do infuse and inform the growth and livelihood of your business. And so I've seen a campaign infused with empathy versus a campaign not in real time. I've seen uh struggling business owners show the striving and be transparent and redeem and i've seen them keep that in and flounder like i've seen all of this evidence so many times in real time that i now feel that as a professional strategist who's also highly emotional i can get in there and be like okay it's not just a buzzword it's important it's sustaining it's differentiating it's groundbreaking. It's new. It's not just 
a good touchy feely thing that we should aim at. But also it's not always available to brand new businesses or super struggling businesses because that's the last thing you want to think about when you're at inbox 976 at the end of the day on a Friday and you have no idea how you're going to stop working. I, absolutely. And of course, you know, most of my, my clients, my audience has an age range of millennials, Gen X mostly, mm -hmm. but my clients are upper Gen X and boomers. So yeah. our generation, we were trained, told don't get emotional <laughs> about anything. And so yeah. we weren't allowed to really have these emotions threaded through our life out in public. Mm -hmm. And so it is, it has become a, a thing for us now to go, Oh, we need to get in tap with, we need to get in touch with that and let the world know yeah. we're human in the process. If that well, is as a geriatric millennial, like <laughs> it's, we, we are the I answer so to sorry. you. I don't know how that phrase right? came about, but that sucks. Oh, <laughs> I love it. I'm like, I will not claim full millennial. I will not but crotchety old grandpa millennial, like get off my lawn, but still millennial millennial. It's absolutely me like, mm. but we are the answer to you, right? Where it's like, it's kind of like how the, you know, the sixties were an answer to the fifties and the eighties were an answer to the seventies, right? Like millennials came up behind y'all. Like, what if we just over emoted constantly? Like, so the pendulum swing way wide right way yeah. wide into touchy feely performative out there inclusive transparent all of the things and i think it's been really interesting because like you my listeners tend to skew younger but my the majority of my clients are boomers and so it's always kind of interesting to do that permissive like it's okay you don't have to be so air quotes professional you can show up as yourself you can let people in you can have work friends be real friends you can befriend your clients you still want to be boundaried boundaries are a big freaking big, deal big deal big deal but but professionalism and the way that you were taught it is evolving and and certainly as we bring in more Gen Z, who even knows what it's going to look like when they're in charge? Who even knows? Okay, so I think this might be a really good segment because with all of your expertise and knowing there's this emotional component that is now out there, like in use, and that traditionally we have certain mindsets and stigmas around certain roles, like you mentioned mm -hmm. before, like sales. So mm -hmm. there are certain things in my generation that I still see people do. And I'm like, even I know that shit don't work in sales. Like, right. I'm like, why are you, why are you coming at me, bro? I just don't even like that. And I'm, I just recently did a reel about the cold email and that, that whole, oh my God, just, you know, exactly the one I'm talking about. And you didn't even oh. have to see the video. The oh, uh, you don't want to scale your business. And I'm thinking, bitch, not with you. Clearly, this right? approach is not working with me. So no. like, certain approaches of manipulation and the car salesman feel and all of this stuff has yep. been wrapped into that stigma of what yes. it takes to make sales happen. Like so a zillion, we, billion, trillion percent, right? I, and so I'm with you in this, and I want to hear from you though, like. How do you walk people through that? <laughs> well, the question I love to ask is who or what taught you the most about sales? Uh, because I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but a lot of it, I hear a couple of different things. Uh, mom and dad and mom and dad were normally and this is a generational thing too, like fiscally conservative. We don't talk about money. It's ghost to talk about money. Right. We don't show it off, right? Um, and the old like Bible adage, like a generous man does not flaunt their generosity, right? Sure. Um, which I very much agree. If you're out there doing amazing work in the world behind the scenes to like help grow causes and stuff, I don't need to see that all over your social media. You do you, right? But there's a difference when you're trying to receive in exchange for your labors of love, because labors of love, labors of love are still labors, 
Yeah. Right. And like I tell people all the time, I wish that I could pay my mortgage in little fluffy baby goats. I think they're adorable. If we could find a way to go back to the barter system, I am in. I will lead that charge. Yeah. But if I go to Chase love Bank, does not pay the electric bill. <laughs> no. But if I go to Chase Bank and I'm like, I got a half a bag of Doritos, a goat and a bunch of well wishes they'd be like okay we're kicking you out of your house right like we need that but i think you used such an important thing because like one people hear from parents one another thing so many of us our entry-level jobs were under trained sales jobs where we had to hit a quota so so many people that i know have come up through call center sales or through cold calling of some kind or something some horrible ridiculous thing where we didn't have the authority to flip the script and we didn't have any control over customer service right so my first real sales job was to get people to come into a bar for a free happy hour party so it wasn't even sales it was free but my job was to just get them in the door now if they come in the door and have a terrible time who are they going to email their last point of contact in the bar who is that me i wasn't even in the bar i I can't control their experience right if i'm selling you something and the company abuses you that's not on me but it is on me right because i don't have enough interdepartmental control but we take that idea of like this is actually just going to hurt someone i'm probably accidentally swindling someone they're not even going to really like it maybe they can't even afford it we take all that energy with us from you know, all the stuff that we have. I wrote in my book this whole section about the trauma of selling door-to-door wrapping paper as a kid and having that be like the thing. They're like, stranger danger, don't insert yourself, be good, don't go over there, There, don't get ever in, any, in anybody's van. If they offer you candy, run and scream, but by all means, go sell candy to that van. Like, what? Right? So we carry that. Plus, the used car salesman thing. I'm a used car salesman's granddaughter, and my grandpa was so ethical and such a good man and so unemotional because he was greatest generation Mm -hmm. and German that when he died, people came to his funeral and said, Fred Keller was the most honest man I ever freaking knew ever. Never sold me a lemon, never oversold me, always listened, always asked about how the kids were, right? Like they came to his freaking funeral and he was a used car salesman. But we get that idea of being spammy or salesy or pushy because we don't understand the role of what you first said of manipulation in selling. And so one of the main questions I love when I'm breaking people up with their stigma of sales is first off the one I asked you, who taught you the most about sales and were they right? But then, is sales manipulative? Yes or no? And my answer is absolutely yes. People expect me to say no. The answer to is sales manipulative is heck yes. But, Christy, what is the name of a movie or a TV show or a book or something that you super love? Wonder Woman. Okay. Wonder (laughs) I mean, there she is. Okay. (laughs) So, when she is spinning in a circle and the bullets are flying off of her bracers and when she's showing up strong and doing stuff that nobody ever expected and when diana's just out there just killing it and you get that feeling in your chest like she's doing this for all of us she's conquering this for me and you get that tight feeling in your chest that feels like you might cry but also you might yell but also you're just really really happy and scared at the same time Sure. Wonder Woman is manipulating the writers and creators of Wonder Woman are manipulating the ever loving daylights out of you. Yes. They know. (laughs) They know. Right. They very much know that at that moment, you're going to bite your nails down to the quick. Because you don't know what's happening. Oh, she's in a trap. How is she going to get out? In order for the episode to be successful, you have to feel that way. But the difference is when you sit down to watch Wonder Woman, you know 
she's going to get into a pickle and then she's going to get out of it. She's going to look amazing the whole time. And she's going to do this for all women. And I'm every woman. And now we're suddenly singing Shaka Khan. Like what? <laughs> they know that you're going to do that. You have to do that, but you're doing that with consent. Right. And so if I am teaching someone how they can help their small business survive, I need them to possibly uncomfortably, but with consent, look at that, what struggle feels like for them in their day to day, in their body, in their family. I got to lead them down that path. It's handheld. It doesn't have to be gross. But if you're not going to look at the problem, I can't sell you a solution sell tylenol without talking about headaches you can't tylenol has to manipulate you to remind you that soon for whatever reason you will be in pain but again it's consensual consensual manipulation where sales gets nasty is if wonder woman promised you one set of emotions and one set of experiences while all the while engineering whatever they want for you without caring that that's how you want to feel without caring that you want to get that joyful anxious so excited adrenaline feeling in your throat right if i don't listen to you and i sell you whatever i want you to buy while using your emotions to get you there that is manipulation without consent but if I know that you're coming to me to help you solve a problem and I'm going to show you and help you through the thoughts and emotions of the positives and the negatives so that you can come to the conclusion that's right for you, that's manipulation with consent. And that's what we all need to learn how to do. We need to learn how to be better advocates, better storytellers, and better handholders throughout. That was amazing. Thank and you. yeah. So, okay. Where, where then does a small business person start? Where would you even start dealing with this? I would start by thinking about the times that you are sold to beautifully. Because so many of us keep a running log of all the times that we were sold to terribly. Yep. And we label that as sales. We're like, that's sales. Okay, so the cold outreach, the I just sent, I got a cold email uh, or a cold outreach, cold DM on LinkedIn. Are you interested? And I just wrote back, no, thank you. And they wrote back immediately before you say no. And I'm like, I already said no. Scroll up. I already said no. Like, you're not going to convince me. Uh, I already said no, right? But yeah. so people see that transaction which is gross because they're not listening to me and they file that under sales and they go in order to sell well i have to hear a no and ignore it got it okay that's what i'm being taught by what i see right get but, so many no's to get to the yes right and so you're like okay apparently that's what i have to do that makes me uncomfortable i don't want to chase people after they say no so i guess i'll never be good at sales hold that thought on the flip side of that when we are sold too beautifully, we either A, don't really mark it. We don't put it in our logbook as sales. We either just sort of let it roll off our shoulders as a nice, positive, warm, touchy experience, or we label it as customer service. Ah. The barista who knows your drink order and convinces you into the cake pop you didn't know you wanted, you go, oh. They're amazing. They always got service with a smile. That's customer service. Nah, -uh. they upsold you into that cake pop. That is sales, baby. But we don't call it that. We call positive selling experiences customer service. We call negative selling experiences sales. Ah, Yikes. Interesting. So what I want everyone to do, right? But yeah. what I want everybody to do is think about the people that you are glad to pay. Think about the people that you're glad to pay. A lot of the time when I talk to people, especially if they're running a business and have kids, whoever that child care provider is, is worth their weight in gold. They probably have to pay them in actual gold because child care is extremely <laughs> expensive. Yeah. But they cough that money right up because the kid adores them. They come home happy. Safe. They're learning. They're doing great in school. They're safe and they're growing into the kind of person that, you know, means that they have good role models. Okay, awesome. Take all my money. 
right? But again, we call that, oh, they're so good at customer service or they're so good with the kid. Yeah, they're also really good at sales because they raised your rate and, they're, and you're still paying it right like they're good at that so start looking at the times you are sold to gorgeously and catalog those as often as you catalog the negative but the step i don't see people taking is first cataloging the positive but then also what you were talking about the compliment you gave me at the very beginning how do we turn those emotions into action items right so in the example of that cold LinkedIn, I have a rule in my sales book that says, once I get a no, it's a no. It's a no. If I get a maybe, if I get a not now, if I get confusion or uncertainty, I keep going with love. But once I get a no, I'm out. No is law. Right now, for me, that's the right choice. But I base that specifically on messages like that's what they say before you say no. And I'm like, no, that just makes yeah, me angry. I do not like those are the approaches. I, right. I, so I'll conf like this is always a good cathartic thing for me. I love this show because <laughs> I'm always on the hot spot with you guys. Yep. So when I get those cold reach outs, I admit it, I immediately will shut down because I'm like, what am I doing in my own sales approach? Because this sucks. But then I don't mm -hmm. take the time to, because I'm off doing other, you know, business ownery things. I haven't spent the time yeah. on my sales systems and verbiage and approach. And, mm -hmm. and, and honestly, I get this existential crisis. I'm like, am I really doing it from my heart? And do I give a shit about people anymore? Like sometimes that one cold email is this off the cliff downward spiral. And then I'm, I'm like, I'm sales out. Like, I don't want to do it right now. Yes. I'm just out. And because I got so on your way out, write down an action item. Let yourself check out until you don't need to. But the way that you're going to check out less is promise yourself you will only ever do the opposite. Yeah. And yes. commit that to law. Right. And so and on the positive, though, too, where if somebody comes to you and they're like, look, 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 I honor your budget. You told me where your budget is, and I hear you. However, the best way for me to serve you is out of that budget. But I still want to tell you about what I can offer you because I think there's a way to make that money up, potentially. Wow. They met me. They were honest. They told me that it's beyond budget up front. They explained to me why. They still want to talk through it, but they're not pressuring me. They're just saying, may I? It's permission-based, right? So that take your action answer there. If you're going to talk to somebody out of budget, bring up the fact that it's out of budget plainly. That's one of my rules, right? Yep. If I'm going to try to push someone beyond their budget, for me, because I teach sales and marketing, I'm always going to try to bring in an element of cost replacement. I can't guarantee that, but I can find out where else they're spending money and maybe help them make a cost replacement buy. I also, for me, because I like to be accessibly priced, I offer payment plans. That's one of my required things because consulting is expensive. Mm -hmm. It's an investment, right? But I took all of those laws out of selling experiences that both I have led and that I have received, positive and negative, right? So if you catch yourself checking out, then give yourself that space. Don't burn yourself out. Don't run that far away. But on the way out, why didn't this work? Is this behavior truly necessary when it comes to this sleazy stuff? No. What were they trying to do? Keep you on the hook. And what would be a better way to do that? Stay top of mind in a human way. If you're connected to someone on LinkedIn, Maybe tag them in some content sometime. Maybe follow up. Wish them a happy birthday. There's a whole lot of ways you can do this, right? But if you're feeling the need to flee, that's because something isn't working for you. On the way out, just ask, why didn't that work? Or, or when it does work, pay just as close attention. And why did it work? Why did that work for you, you as seller or as buyer? Why? So that's, that's where we got to get discernment. Yes. And I don't think we spend enough time in that state. Uh, and I'm, I have a, a scrolling digital frame thing going on at the same time. So my pictures are coming up while we're talking and mm -hmm. my, my travel to Disney is coming up. 
So when I go Ooh. to Disney, right, when I go to Disney World, regardless of what anybody thinks about Disney World right now or Disney in general, a side note, don't give a shit. When I go to Disney World, I know the creative thought process. There's a real process. There's real stories. There's real effort and detail put into literally every step that you take on that resort, everything. And oh, yeah. when you look at it from terms of a business owner, like how, what did they do here? What works? Like, and how can I implement whatever they're doing here to get all of us to spend an ungodly amount of money? Yeah. <laughs> it's joyfully all- bankrupt. People go actually literally bankrupt at Disney. It just it happens. You want the experience and that whole experience yes. is around helping you feel like you are one escaping reality yep. and happy <laughs> and welcome and yes. safe. Yeah. And wanted. Right. So Disney, I love that you brought this up because you asked me at the very beginning, what do I want people to know about me before I'm in the room? Mm-hmm. I don't know what your family or my family would do at Disney. I don't know if you're going to go spend all your time at Epcot or you're going to go on every ride or it's really important that you get character meet and greets with your kids. I don't know what your specifics are, but I do know that no matter what you choose, Disney has gone to great extremes to make sure that you feel exactly how you want to feel while you do whatever of those things that you choose to do. Mm -hmm. Right. So that if you do the character meet and greets, those characters, whether you have special needs or not, whether you're a family or a single, whether you're whatever, doesn't matter. Those characters are going to make sure that they are stepping into the role so you can escape and feel connected and get that really good hug on. Right. If you're on the rides, they're going to make sure that those rides are thrilling, transportative, enjoyable, humorous. They're going to make sure that you're feeling unexpected emotion. Right. That's what makes it fun. If you're wandering Epcot, they're going to make sure that the languages and the food and the music changes as you go from place to place to place. So you can truly feel transported. Right. They put that intentionality. How are you going to foster feeling that we could all take? Right. When people are listening to your podcast, how do you want the listener to feel when people are on your landing page? What transformation are we doing? I'm not in Disney anymore. I'm in France now. How are we facilitating that? Right. And it's all, all, all intentionality little bit of psychology and a lot of play absolutely again love in this com- conversation love this conversation okay so what are some th- well actually before i get to these other questions i have i'm going to have a piece of content at some point because i'm i run into a lot with my clients or perspectives who think and behave as if marketing is sale. So what are your thoughts on marketing activities that are treated as if they should produce sales? Oh boy. Okay. So this was me. This was me for the longest time. I called it the martyrdom of over marketing because I thought if I just marketed and 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 marketed, that I would never have to ask, right? That people would just voluntarily throw money at me. And what I've learned is, is I'm not a Kardashian and I don't just get paid to exist. Right. Shoot. At least not yet. Right. But in the businesses, you know, and love and the businesses, you know, and hate, There are two, I sound like the beginning of Law and Order, two separately but equally important departments, okay? There's a sales department, which is in charge of conversion, 
and there is a marketing department which is in charge of attention and awareness right and so i think where we get a little screwed up is through this very well-meaning adage called no like trust yes no like trust is a marketing campaign marketing and what people say is if they know you like you and trust you then they'll buy from you that part is untrue if they know you like you and trust you they will favor you in buying situations that's the truth of it if they know you like you and trust you that puts you up in a position of power when it comes time to be sold to right but if i went to a restaurant that smelled really really amazing and had gorgeous pictures on the menu and no one ever came to my table to take my freaking order even if the restaurant smelled incredible i would get frustrated and i would leave because there was no opportunity to buy no opportunity to buy there's just me being like oh welcome to my beautiful wonderful smelling restaurant with pictures of food everywhere other people are eating you don't know how you're what now you're going to them begging them for referrals who the heck do i talk to about getting some food around here and they go i don't know it just showed up on our table i guess it's because we hoped enough right but that's what we do but there's a marketing department and a sales department and for so many of us that are every single department including customer service and our own social media right like mm -hmm. it gets murky and so what i say is no like trust paves the way you still got to fly the plane absolutely and how you do that is through ethically enthusiastically asking for business if you're not going to ask which is sales you are going to be a very well-liked celebrity expert who is broke, which is how I lived for many years. I was like the most popular person on the internet and I had no money. Didn't have two nickels to rub together, but dang everyone, my testimonials were through the roof. That's you can't sustain a business that way. No, you cannot sustain a business. The business is there to produce revenue, provide yeah. value, produce revenue. Yes. Yes, and exchange a product or service for money. Yeah. That's it, right? And so I, it's so, marketing is shinier and doesn't have as much stigma. It feels more fun. It feels eventful. But I always think of it as, you know, 25 miles of the marathon is marketing. But if at the end of it, if I get to 25.2, and I could see the finish line in the distance and go, well, I pretty much did the thing and go and sit down. I'm not getting a medal. I'm not getting my photo taken. And my family at the finish line is going to be really confused about where the heck I want. But we do that all the time. I do that all the time. I used to, I mean, I did, I did. I don't need more. But I would get to the end of a sales conversation and I would do what I call like dry, cry, fly, or die, right? Like I would just, mm. and you know, dry is where you shape shift into becoming suddenly extremely professional. Thank you so much for having me on your show today, Christy. And before I go, I would like everyone to know that they can find me at my website. Like who the heck is that? No, those people don't right? come on the show. <laughs> no, but fly, you probably get a lot of people who come on and fly. And what I would do for fly is I would just be like, oh, this has been such a great conversation. And then you at the end of the show would be like, Annie, tell people where to find you. And I'd be like, I don't know, Instagram, bye. <laughs> ah, ah. Like that's what I would do all the time. I would get people on to a 30 minute sales call. I would basically talk at them for 28 minutes and then panic because I realized I don't know anything about them because I talked to them for 28 minutes and then I would thank them for their time and hang up. No, I just wasted both of our time. Right? So I, I'm not interjecting because you're absolutely right. <laughs> that's, that's what I used to do though. Hey, bye. Thanks so much for your time. I hope that in the future you'll consider working with me. And if you do, you know where to find me. Why? So you can just not sell to me again? okay so you can fill me with the restaurant full of food and no wait staff okay, okay. 
understood, Annie. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. So if we were to get really specific on something that you would advise small business to not do, what would that be? Take your sales script and burn it. Don't if take you your bought... sales script. Wait. No, no do wait. it. Do it. Dude, take your okay. sales script and burn it do it because it's robbing you of two critical things number one your individuality if you have purchased a sales script or a swipe file or something that is meant to help you close sales you need to look at that as an outline only if you're copying that language you're robbing yourself of individuality number one and number two more critically your sales script is robbing you of the true gift of sales which is the time and spaciousness to listen if i'm cramming a spiel down your throat i'm not listening so i'd rather you take your script burn it come back with better questions spend more time listening less time talking and then you'll really know if you're the right fit for this person so that you know what to offer them how to offer it to them what the objections are going to be up front you get all that by listening not through your sales script so you you brought so up what i want to yeah. come back with better questions like mm -hmm. how important are the questions infinitely at every phase of the sales conversation as icebreakers right small talk turns off approximately 74 percent of your buyers right from the jump it's not that you don't want to build rapport. You do, but it's very similar to podcasting. If you and I had gotten on today and we never really got to the point, we just kind of blew compliments at each other and sort of skirted the issue. And I kind of half answered your questions and just sort of, you know, never really got there. That's an incomplete pass. Mm -hmm. Small talk and listening to people gab at each other is not effective instead get to the meat if someone is there to help you solve a problem in their life you don't have to go in disgustingly unfiltered and crawl up in there and you know bash their boundaries to bits but if they're there to solve a problem let's get to the root of that problem pretty quickly so that they know that their time and trust in you is well placed right so at the very beginning the questions you ask matter after or during your pitch I always think of it like playing Plinko on The Price is Right or, or uh, yeah, where yep, it's yep. bouncing back and forth between my offers. Are they good for this side? Are they good for that side? Are they good for this offer? Is this a now buy? Is this a later buy? Right. I'm using the questions I'm asking largely about the currencies, which is money, time and energy, not just money. I'm asking questions about what they want to commit to to help me make sure that I'm selling to them something that will work for them, right? Back to the restaurant. I'm not gonna sell you an all you can eat buffet if you just came in for a snack. Mm -hmm. No matter what I do, why even try, right? If I listen and you're like, oh, I'm just feeling a little peckish. I think we're mostly here for cocktails. Then I'm gonna bring you the cocktail menu and make more money. Right? The questions that you ask at the end help them see that their objections are just points of confusion or concern and that you're willing to face them. The questions that you ask when they do object show that you're tackling this ethically. The questions that you ask at the end of the conversation help prep you for your follow up. Right? So, all throughout, the questions you ask are king. And if you're obeying somebody else's prepackaged, you know, spam me sales script, you're robbing yourself of the, your ability to do all of that. Yeah, I get those a lot in my email. <laughs> the ones that, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about that, the what not to do. And if anybody's mm -hmm. interested, go check out my reel. So, um, and that's, and and honestly, that's about the only time that I, I play the CEO card. Like, I don't have time for your shit because I am the CEO. Right. Technically, I am, but like, right. I shouldn't even right. say that. Like, you should have done your homework. <laughs> exactly. 
And sometimes when we're not listening, we have done our homework or we're not asking questions. We have done our homework, but we're coming across that we haven't done our homework because we're just spieling at people. Don't spiel. If you've done your homework, tell them, hey, listen, I spent a lot of time on your website this weekend and here's what I see. Tell me how that lands. Put it back on them. Okay, if you've done the research, show me. Yeah, I people come at me and get it wrong all the time. Like, yeah, I'm not even willing for this right now. <laughs> I mean, podcast pitches are the worst of it. I have a small business pop culture podcast and I get pitched all the time. I've been listening to your show. I freaking love it. It's the best show. Oh, it's so good. And here's my pitch for you. I want to come on copy paste of the thing that they send to everybody else. Mm hmm. And I scroll the whole thing and I know whether or not you're lying to me. Oh, I've listened to your show. I love their show because anybody that's actually listened to my show says one of two things. Number one, I have no idea what my pop culture topic could be or should be. Is that something that you're willing to workshop with people or Annie? Why haven't you done an episode about 90 day the other way? Here's how I think it pertains. Those people get on the show. Everybody else that lies to me and tells me they listen to my show so much and then copy and paste their spiel in without a pop culture reference to be found. You just outed yourself as a liar and a lazy one at that. Bye. So do, those, do I even respond to those messages? No, that's where I go, CEO. I don't owe you a response to your crappy form email. Right. Right. But if someone comes to me and goes, I don't know, I'm not really big into pop culture, but I love your show and I love the way that it, you bring in so much humor. But like my musical taste ended in 1952. I'm going to write back and be like, want to talk about the Great American Songbook? Want to talk about Tony Bennett? He just passed. Like that's that gives me something to work with because I know you actually listened. Selling is the exact same way. Whether you're selling totally me to bring you on my show or something else, right? Any day, superheroes. Any, any day. Care. But if you pitch to me, you would say, <laughs> I want to talk about small business lessons from Wonder Woman because I love her. And some ideas are because you would have done your research and you would have told me that. Mm -hmm. It's no different on the selling situation. If you know you're right for someone specifically, tell them why and tell them about why you're right for them, not why they're right for you. Your website is you're in the right place. Your sales conversation is here's what I want to bring to your table. It's not the same conversation. I agree. I'm and I love this conversation. Okay. So so who, who inspired you? Like, where did you get all this from? Or is this just like, you know, good old fashioned trial and error? Who has inspired you to become this Annie? A lot of it is trial and error, but I would be remiss if I didn't thank the people that have tolerated me and fostered <laughs> me along the way. Uh, I am the child of two entrepreneurs, so I'm very, very lucky um, that I got to see that going my own way was possible from a very young age. I was also like forced child labor in those businesses at a very young age, which uh, kind of helped me from buying into entrepreneurial hype where it's this idea of like, do something you love and you'll never work. And I'm like, Bullshit. really? Cause my whole family was, you know, stuff in boxes of swag hats at three o'clock in the morning. And I think we'd all rather have been asleep, but okay. Uh, technically we were doing something we loved, which was right. making money like, oh God. <laughs> right. Um, but so my parents were definitely a um, big exampling in that. But along the way, I've also had incredible coaches, mentors, and advisors who have held me to a standard that I couldn't necessarily see because they saw stuff in me when I wasn't being consistent. They saw consistency in me. When I didn't feel brave, they saw bravery in me. When I didn't feel creativity, they fostered that in me. Um, and so that's my, my coach, my work fam, um, and the people that have my, my first and original clients, my original super fans who said, listen, you got to keep going. Cause there's something special here. Um, I am here because of all of those people, every single one.
So what do you have coming up on the horizon for you and your business? And how are you going to accomplish it? I am launching a whole new podcast in addition to my other podcast. And I told myself I could do this when I created spaciousness because what I don't have is more room to do more, less directly paid things. Right. Uh, But I'm launching my whole new show because I have diligently crafted space by, uh, tying some pretty things up in a bow by taking some projects out back and old yeller shooting them. You know, I've, I've given myself that <laughs> spaciousness. Uh, and, and so that's what I'm so, so excited about. I'm also traveling more again. I was traveling a lot before COVID. I was doing a lot of in-person workshops and in-person speeches. And then that understandably uh died away because the whole world didn't shut down but here in chicago we really really did um and so i that's the way that i went and so now it's been fun i just got back on the workshop uh really fabulous speech i'm getting ready for another one i just booked airfare for another one yesterday so it feels very lovely to be out in the world again <laughs> okay we're gonna we're gonna go back a hot second here. <clears throat> You're gonna old yeller some projects. <laughs> yep. Yep. I have not. I mean, while I, because I usually like, I will sit around the office and I look. I'm like, yeah, I need to go through that box. That box needs to be purged. But yep. to look at my strategy board and projects that I want to include for key you know, key projects for the year or upcoming thing and the ideas and, par- you know, parking lots and blah, 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 sticky notes, whatever you want to call it. There is stuff on the board. And I have not one time went through here and said, I need to old yeller some projects. I should yep. probably, that would be smart to do. You love them, but they got to go. That's exactly it. I mean, when your business is your baby, And when you've been taught that over and over, like, oh, it's your baby. Oh, it's your passion. Oh, it's your calling. Oh, it's your purpose. Oh, it's this precious, adorable thing. Right? Like, and then it comes time for that part of it to end. It's going to hurt. So I call it old yellering because they know they have to do it. They know it's got to go. The dog has rabies. Spoilers for old yeller. Um which you know came out in i think like 1931 so if you're not up on the old yeller but like the dog has rabies the dog has got to go the dog is now a public health threat still the dog you love but things have changed right and so i have had offers that i have loved offering i have had price points that i have adored staying at i have had clients that I thought I would serve for forever, but for whatever reason, right? They always say like people come into your life for a reason, a season, a moment, or a lifetime. Like, so do your offers. So do your clients. Not all of them are going to be lifetime. A lot of them are going to be really important steps on the way to something else. And if we white knuckle grab onto every single business asset that we've ever had and never allow ourselves to evolve then we're going to wind up with this rabid dog that we love so much but no one can come over to the house yeah yep you know and so it's like it old yellowing your business freaking sucks it sucks but if i hadn't ever done that I wouldn't have done my essential rebranding. I wouldn't have allowed myself evolution and I'd still be charging 50 bucks an hour for consulting, which I can't live on. No. Well, I'm so glad that you did that then. I'm so glad that you did that whole process for your business. And I'm very excited to see all that you have on the horizon come to life. So I can't wait to hear more about it in the future. And Annie, I want to thank you so much for all of your insight and your time today, your energy into this episode. I have loved it. I'm hoping the people who are listening have taken their notes. And the big takeaway is it's the paradigm shift. You're going to have to shift the way you think about it to then do Mm -hmm. something different with it. So 
But what if the way you think about it, instead of changing the way you think about it and that being a failure, what if on the other side, you could really truly learn to love the art of selling and receiving? Yes. What if you could? What if it didn't change anything about you? What if it just made your life better? Because that's what I see all the time. All the time. And that's what I want for each of the listeners today. Awesome. Thanks, Annie, so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us for this Summer of Strategy series on Small Business Success Talk. Remember to share us with your network, leave us a great review, and subscribe for the latest episodes.